Mr. Nash, you can begin. Yeah. Good morning uh, to all of you. Let me welcome our members of Indo American Chamber of Commerce and also our guests. Uh, my name is Sudhir Das, and I'm the Executive Vice President of uh, Indo American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, as you know, uh, we have this Sustainable Development Committee. Uh, as a part of this committee activities, we periodically share with you interesting topics through <clears throat> webinars. And uh, so this is, uh, I think, third or fourth of uh, the series of webinars that we have organized in the last uh, you know, one and a half months. And we continue to, we'll you know, like to continue to have more and more We know business is opening, and uh, that's a good sign. And uh, so we might, uh, you know, later on think about organizing the seminars in the evenings or weekends, which will give you time to, you know, attend the webinars even after doing your business or office. Now, a little bit about today's topic, and I'll speak for only about five to seven minutes. So I'll introduce the topic and the speaker, and then, uh, you know, I will invite our resource person, the speaker, to come in. Now, as you know, all of us have been running businesses, you know, uh, various kinds of business. And what we do in any business is we essentially use resources, right? So we use resources. We convert the resources through a process into a saleable product. And uh, whatever is saleable, we sell and earn revenue out of that. Whatever is not saleable, essentially, is a waste. And uh, so, you know, uh, that 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 goes as a, you know, hopefully we do a proper disposal of the waste. Now, what is important is that when we use the resources, most of the resources are, are actually our natural resources. You know, whether we're using minerals, whether we're using uh, water, whether we're using air, you know, whether we're using fuel, which is coming from essentially hydrocarbon or coal. Essentially, we're using a whole lot of resources. And the amount of money that we actually pay as a transaction cost, that means, you know, for buying the resource is not really the actual value of the resource and the opportunity cost of the resource. And the fact that this resource will not be available for others to use especially our next generation, our future generations to use. So frankly, the value of the natural resource is essentially, and the opportunity cost of that essentially is something around the topic of the day, which is natural capital valuation. So all these natural capitals, how can we put a number? How can we do a valuation of these? How can we know that when we are using the resource, what actually is the cost incurred to the environment, to the society, to the economy, to the future generation. It is just not the cost of buying the resource that I'm paying, that we are paying, you know, uh, while we buy the coal or petroleum or, you know, we use water. Water, unfortunately, is sort of people think that water is a free resource available, but water possibly is the most expensive natural resource. And we will come to know about it, especially certain parts of the world and certain parts of India, actually. We have seriously, you know, seeing the cost of the resource and the cost of resource is actually the cost of not having water. That is the cost of the resource. So uh, essentially, today's topic, our resource person, Mr. Sanjeev Raman, uh, he's going to share with you our thoughts and certain thoughts about how the natural resources can be, how we can put a value around that. So that's the capital, the natural resource capital that we have, that we have. The capital that we're investing, that we're using, that possibly we are exploiting today, that possibly we are abusing today. Pardon my using the words, strong words, but we are actually abusing all of us and uh, and exploiting. And so, you know, once we have a number around that, once we know the value, once the number goes to the boardrooms, then is the time when the when the decision makers will actually realize, and maybe then they will you know, use the resources in a more frugal manner. 
Okay, so that is the objective of this particular, uh, you know, uh, knowledge sharing session. That is the that is the objective. And if 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 even one percent of you know us, one percent of the people who are listening today are impacted, even as less as one person are impacted, we will feel that we are we have added some value. We'll feel that we have we have you know the 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 entire effort of doing the webinar is useful, and. Uh, so that is that is what it is all about. Uh, let me introduce our resource person, the speaker today, Commander uh, Sanjeev Raman. Commander Raman is a retired uh, naval commander. He is a part of uh, the Sustainable Development Committee of Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. He is, by background, he is an engineer and he is also a management expert. He's an MBA, and uh, in addition to you know having a very successful naval uh, you know career post retirement he took early retirement post retirement he is a very successful entrepreneur and he is also an author you know he writes he discusses and he's also a teacher he's a faculty i know in several uh, you know management schools uh, so let me welcome uh, commander raman uh, over to you sanjeev raman thank you Thank you very much, Sudipta sir, for the opening remarks. So I will start with just let me start to share the screen and then uh, it will be yes. So thank you, uh, sir, for the opening remark. Uh, it's certainly an honor uh, to hear uh, such words from you, person of your stature. So I welcome all the people uh, who are participating in this webinar on behalf of uh, IACC and the Sustainable Development Group. I extend a very warm welcome to you. So whenever we are talking, uh, the topic for our discussion today is role of nature capital in organizational sustainability. Now, organizations' priorities have uh, triggered various shifts in past, I would say, 100 years or so to the present situation where the focus now is on creating an individualistic characteristics for the organization. An organization is focusing to build a very, very strong, responsible, and a conscious organization for its long-term sustainability. They do not want that the organization ecosystem should degrade its values to an extent where the organization is not able to deliver the desired results in long term. So if you talk from the organization, business organization point of view, if any business organization uh, doesn't uh, generate enough cash or its cash generation capability is compromised, that organization will sooner or later die. The same is the case with environment. Because if we continue to exploit the environment and do not think of replenishing it, then its ability to provide us the desired services in the long term, in the long term would be greatly compromised. So keeping this perspective in mind, I have decided to speak on the role of nature capital in organizational sustainability. And when I was uh, you know, formulating this topic, I was thinking as to how I should go about describing this topic. So I had a couple of discussions with some of my friends, and the very first question which many people asked is, what do you mean by nature capital? So then I thought that, you know, it is very, very essential that first, this terminology, what do you mean by nature capital? How do we understand an ecosystem and biodiversity? That should be very well understood by uh, the participants. And then how do I we economically link this 
to an organizational perspective, not only to an organization perspective, even at the community level, at an individual level, at a national level, and even at a global level. So there has to be an economic linkage. Only then we will be able to assign some kind of value to that. Then what are the different types of ecosystem services which we get from the environment? How do we account for each of these ecosystem services? What would be the broad framework to understand how this flow of services happens? And how do we account for this flow of services? And at the end, we will discuss certain uh, benefits of ecosystem in terms of giving life examples, which uh, many countries, nations, or society as an individual, they have benefited from this. So let us come to the very basic question. What is nature capital? Now, nature capital is a metaphor for the limited stock of physical and biological resources found on Earth and of the limited capacity of the ecosystem to provide ecosystem services. Now, this definition, if you see, it emphasizes on certain words, limited stock, which means that, yes, there is a limitation in the assets available in the environment. If you continue to use it, obviously, it will, at some point in time, it will vanish. So there is a limitation to the assets which is available with us for exploitation. And based on that assets, the ecosystem provides us some services. So it has a limitation in capacity to provide that services. So with this, we come to the question of what do we mean by an ecosystem? So in our organization terms, we very generally we use this term uh, most of the time within the organization. So for a business organization, for example, an ecosystem means all the stakeholders who are part of the organizations. So you talk about uh, you know supply chain professionals or HR or finance or vendors, admin, security. They are all stakeholders in the organization. And they all form an ecosystem for the organization where the contribution of everybody has to be there to get the desired results. So from the ecosystem environmental point of view, what do you mean by an ecosystem? Now, ecosystem from the environmental perspective means a large community of living organisms, plants, animals, or microbes in a particular area. The living and the physical components, they are linked together by a nutrient cycle and energy flow. Now, it can be terrestrial, freshwater, or marine ecosystem. So when I say that they have to be linked, that means there is some kind of internal processes which is happening within this uh, you know, ecosystem. Only then it, work, it, it works as a, as a one functional unit. The way we are talking about an organizational ecosystem, same with the environmental ecosystem also works as an independent functional unit. So for example, a forest, living coral reefs, deserts, savannas, rainforest, tundra, they are all ecosystem. So if you're talking about, say, for example, a, a coral reef ecosystem, it provides so many goods and services to the people who are living in the coastal community or uh, coastal population, it provides a lot of goods and services. And at the same time, it also gives protection against wave erosion. So it functions as a unique ecosystem for the marine environment and for the people who live and utilize those facilities within that uh, ecosystem. Now, this definition, it lays emphasis on large community. So whenever we talk about a large community, for any kind of uh, a nutrient cycle or an energy flow to be maintained, we require diversity within the community. Only then we will be able to maintain an energy flow and it can function as an independent unit. So that comes that diversity, because of the diversity, we should understand what do we mean by diversity, biodiversity in an ecosystem. Now, biodiversity primarily means 
the variability among the living organisms including terrestrial marine and other aquatic ecosystems and biodiversity includes diversity within the species between the species and between an ecosystem so in, in an environment you can have within the framework you can have different types of ecosystem which would also have a biodiversity existing between an ecosystem which we will elaborate at a later stage and each ecosystem has got a wide variety of species so within the species there will be a biodiversity which is existing so that means we are talking about quantity and quality so both quantity and quality attributes of biodiversity is very important when we are considering the link between the nature and the economic activity which leads to a human well-being so unless and until you have got enough quantity or the quality within this ecosystem the biodiversity if it doesn't exist then you cannot have this economic activity sustainable over a long period of time at some point in time it will decide it will die so you this quantity and quality aspect of biodiversity is very very important and as a, as human beings we have been time and again interfering with this quantity or the quality aspects knowingly sometimes unknowingly whether you talk about using use of uh, chemical fertilizers or genetically modified seeds or maybe when we experiment with natural occurring activity within the microorganism which i feel possibly is the case of covid-19 pandemic so if we are experimenting with this kind of thing just to change the nature of the quantity or the quality then in the long run it will have a very negative effect on human well-being and the sustainability so whenever we are talking about quantity and quality and it is linking to the economic activity so we should understand what is the cost of this biodiversity because any economic activity has to have some kind of cost element associated with it so whenever we are talking about cost of a biodiversity the question which comes to our mind is what is against what this cost needs to be mapped to so that there is a cost which is associated with the economic activity which is the benefits which we derive from the biodiversity then there is a cost associated with lost biodiversity and there is a third element of the cost which is associated with our failure to take any kind of preventive action and this needs to be done this evaluation of the analysis or understanding of the cost has to be done right at the global level even at the national level or you know state level community level even for a business organization unless and until we understand this cost concept or an economic value to that we will not be able to assign uh, a value to, to the nature capital and the benefits which we are deriving from this and why this cost is important importance of understanding the cost and the economic benefit that is important because our prosperity it gives addresses two important issues which is why prosperity and poverty reduction depends on maintaining this flow of services from the ecosystem again we are when talking about prosperity and poverty reduction we should understand that we have a very large section of people who live in rural areas and india primarily is an agricultural uh, you know country and we have got a very large population who resides in the rural area they drive lot of benefits from the environment and possibly they face a very high or a disproportionate uh, loss uh because of the depletion of these natural resources although they get the benefit but do not to that extent negatively impact the environment the impact of our on the environment is done by somebody else but the disproportionate loss is faced by this rural population so that is why 
the prosperity and poverty reduction factor comes into play whenever we do a cost benefit analysis of that and the second aspect is why successful environment protection needs to be grounded in sound economics which includes explicit recognition efficient allocation fair distribution of cost and benefits of conservation sustainable use of natural resources so again when we are talking about sound economics now sound economics is very very important because nation as a whole suffers due to depletion of soil due to poor air quality shortage of water and so many other natural resources and uh, a whole range of economic and social objective of the nation gets uh, you know hampered if we are not able to analyze the sound soundness of the economics and linking it to the benefit which we derive out of that so even from the business perspective if, if you are talking any business organization should also cater uh, of this economics whenever they are deciding about any kind of business operation because most of the benefits or the primary production for their business operation they derive from the ecosystem and possibly they impact the ecosystem in a more negative way than the benefits which they are deriving and one of the uh, recent case i would say would be the oil spill in the gulf of mexico so certainly the company would have uh, lost millions and billions of dollars in lawsuits and you know taking measures to preserve the environment and certainly it has dented its reputation beyond repair so it also has an image impact on the organization over the long run even from the individual or the community point of view you know it affects us if you are if you are not able to understand how it is economically impacting us whether in terms of ill health or income or various kinds of uh, you know social or other aspects of human well being so that is why we need to understand the economic linkage and whenever we understand talk about an economic linkage it requires an understanding of how this ecosystem functions if we do not understand how this ecosystem functions then how can i you know put an uh, you know value to that and how can i assign an economic uh, you know element or a component to this ecosystem so it is very important to understand how the ecosystem functions how do they provide such services and how it is affected by various external pressures now this is very very important because it helps us to gain an insight into the link between biodiversity and the ecosystem services as well as their capability and capacity to provide such services under the changing climatic conditions so whenever we are talking about uh, the kind of uh, services which we derive it has got both tangible components as well as intangible components tangible components by tangible components i mean the kind of uh, things which can be immediately linked to market whether you talk about timber you talk about food stock livestock so these are all commodities which are tradable in the market and you can easily account for that but there are a whole lot of intangible benefits and uh, there is a element of invisibility which is existing in its accounting process so intangible benefits or intangibles are those components for which internally or by behaviorally we are willing to pay a price or pay a, 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 a avail such kind of services so unless and until that willingness comes we will not be able to account for the intangible services these are both the tangibles and the intangibles these are we can say the dividend which society receives from the environment and the ecosystem and its benefits unless and until both the invisibility factor 
in the intangible is taken into consideration, we will not be able to change our behavior. And we will continue to have a destructive attitude towards our natural capital. So with this background, let us first understand what type of ecosystem services do we get from this environment, and which we talk about as a nature capital. So there are primarily categorized in the four categories. One is called the provisioning services. The other is called the regulatory services. The third is the habitat or the supporting services. And the fourth is the cultural services. So we'll examine each of these in little detail and see what do you mean by provisioning, regulating, or supporting or cultural services. So let us talk about what do you mean by provisioning services. Now, provisioning services primarily deals with the material output which we get from the ecosystem. And this includes like food. It provides us conditions also to grow food as well as there are consumption stocks like crops, livestock, fish. Um, in, the, in the presentation, you can see there are sort of more elements which are included, you know, gum, vanilla, chocolates, and, and so on and so forth, rubber, there are a whole lot of uh, things. The second is the raw material which we get from the construction activities and fuel, which is timber, you know, burning fuel. There are whole elements of biogas, uh, you know, raw material which we get uh, from the environment. Third important factor is fresh water, which is surface in the ground. But this is one element which we have, it has never synced in our conscience that we need to preserve this. So surface water and ground water, this all comes from the environment. And at, particularly in India, uh, the complete water resource depends upon monsoon. They are all river water, river water. River is also forms part of the ecosystem. So we need to preserve the ecosystem to get first supply of the fresh water for our survival. For the pharmaceutical industry, you've got medicinal plants. So it gives us a range of uh, services which we directly consume and use for our primary production activity and which can be easily monetized. I would say. That accounts for the provisioning services. The next part is the regulating services. Now, these are generally intangibles, what we are talking about. The regulatory services in the ecosystem provides by acting as regulators. That means it regulates the quality of air, soil, or by providing flood and disease control, which are largely, these are services are largely invisible in our day-to-day -day accounting to the society. But this forms majority of the total economic value of the ecosystem. Now, this invisibility of this intangible is what would affect our human conscience and behavior. Unless until we recognize this component of it, we will be losing a major chunk of the economic benefits which are which we are deriving from the ecosystem. So let us see what are these you know uh, regulatory services. Local climate and air quality regulations. So with tree plantation, it influences rainfall. We have got carbon sequestration and storage, which helps in removal of carbon. Moderation of extreme events. So it creates a buffer against flood, landslides, storms, etc. Then wastewater treatment. So a lot of human waste and animal waste, it gets decomposed. The nature itself has got so many microorganisms which decomposes all these wastes and provides a nutrient for its internal maintenance of the nutrient cycle and energy flow. It also improves uh, soil fertility. So erosion prevention and maintenance of soil fertility. Again, this helps us in preventing land degradation as well as desertification. Another aspect is pollination. Now pollination facilitates in crop pollination. This benefit of pollination, which we are not actually understanding, we only focus on the various other aspects of uh, agricultural produce, but actually pollination contributes a lot.
towards our agricultural production. Then biological control, which facilitates in pest and vector control disease. So these are all these all accounts for various types of regulatory services, which we get the benefits of which we get from the environmental ecosystem. And it should be borne in mind that these are the major chunk, and I would say more than two thirds of the benefits which we derive from the environment is accounted by these regulating services. Now, the next important aspect of the habitat services. Now, habitat services is something which underpins almost all services because every uh, living organism, it requires an habitat for its sustainability. So in any case, the habitat services has to be available for, a, for any kind of living organism to function. Even when we are talking about migratory birds, so uh, when they travel across the continent, there are habitats of supporting environment available to them for them to grow. And this type of habitat services, it helps in maintaining the diversity of the different breeds of plants and animals. So this genetic diversity is provided by this habitat services. And we see that you know, so many uh, different kinds of breeds are available in different, different continents across the world. If a service or a habitat is not available in one area, you suddenly find the entire you know, organism, microorganism, birds, animals, they go to another habitat where they are you know, uh, provided with such kind of environment. So it helps in maintaining, as I talked about, the quantity and the quality and the diverseness of the species which are existing within the micro, uh, existing within the ecosystem. The last is the cultural services. Now, these cultural services includes non-material benefits which people obtain when we get in contact with the ecosystem. These includes aesthetic, spiritual, and psychological benefits. So, when we talk about the recreation or mental or physical health, if you go to a very nice landscape, environment, green space. Mentally, you are more relaxed, and a lot of these spaces are used for recreational activities. So, this is also a part of the ecosystem which we are utilizing. Tourism, again, a major booster for economy. If you preserve the uh, the environment and maintain its natural, uh, you know, uh, the way it is, uh, it has appeared in the ecosystem. It promotes tourism, cultural aspirations. So there are a lot of you know uh, places which has got cultural importance. So whenever we talk about, say for example, in, as far as India is concerned, you talk about Vaishno Devi. So Vaishno Devi is a hell. People have got a religious and cultural thing associated with that, and they want to preserve that entire environment. They get a lot of benefits out of that. At the same time, it is promoting your tourism and other aspects. So there is a, uh, an element which Culturally, we would like to preserve whether it is naturally occurring caves or a, a coral reef system, or you know, or a desert. You know, these kinds are. This also provides us with various kinds of services. And the last is the spiritual experience and the sense of place. Now, this is one aspect which is now gaining its importance. Or so I would say, maybe uh, almost uh, three, four decades back. When Osho started with the ashrams, so he provided a, an ecosystem where people can have a spiritual experience. So to get that kind of experience, he has created an environment. And that kind of environment was created worldwide. So the more and more people are coming into this space. Uh, Isha Foundation has created a 100 acre environment in Pamator. They are also creating in so many other places. So it gives you a place where you can have your spiritual experience or helps you to attain uh, you know mental peace so that is also a kind of services which we are deriving from this ecosystem so whenever we are talking about this various kinds of services the question that comes to our mind is how do i account for these services is there a way by which i can account for various kinds of services which 
the environment is providing us. So let us go step by step and see how do we account for this nature capital. The very first aspect which we need to understand is we need to recognize value. Unless and until we recognize a value in that, we will not be able to translate that knowledge into the economics and subsequently into our behavior. Because if you do not recognize the value, then it becomes very, very difficult to influence you know, a human behavior, both from the political terms as well as from the technical terms. So recognizing value is in all aspects of biodiversity is very, very important. So whenever we are talking about recognizing value, uh, if it has got a cultural or a heritage, heritage services associated with it, then automatically you know, it comes in our behavior to preserve that kind of, uh, I would say, uh, the ecosystem. We immediately recognize that kind of value. Whether we visit a, a particular ashram or you visit a national park or you visit a botanical garden, we know that there is a, an importance associated with that. We recognize the value in that and our behavior towards preservation of that changes. And that is how we are able to put a, an economic value towards that. So to recognize value, it is very, very important to identify and assess the complete ecosystem services and its implication to the different groups in society. So when I'm saying of identification, in your ecosystem, there are various services. There are various services which we uh, you know, get from the ecosystem. And these services are delivered to various groups. The business group gets a different kind of benefit out of this service. The nation gets a different kind of benefits. A society gets a different kind of benefit. An individual also gets a different kind of benefit. So there are an, different groups which get different kind of services. So we need to identify the complete range of ecosystem services associated with different groups who take uh, you know, the benefits out of this ecosystem services. Unless and until this complete stakeholding pattern is identified and assessed, we will not be able to recognize value or we will not be able to translate that recognition in the minds of different sections of society to benefit from this ecosystem services. Let us say, say for example, coral reef. Coral reef, we have talked earlier also, it contributes towards fishery, tourism, protection against waves, erosions, threat due to climate change, ocean acidification, overfishing. So these are the various components which we are getting. But primarily understanding that you know, overfishing is bad for my, uh, uh, you know, for the ecosystem, for the coral reef ecosystem is not going to change the behavior or the fishing methods unless and until if we identify and assess and then put some kind of economic value towards that, then only people will start to make changes to nullify their short term benefits which they you know, derive from this overfishing activity, which is ultimately leading to destruction of the ecosystem. So we need to understand the entire aspects. Even from the forest perspective, see one third of the Earth's land and half of the terrestrial species exist in forest. And forest ecosystem provides for two thirds of the primary production in land. So when I were talking about two thirds of the primary production activity happening from the forest, our attitude towards forest is not good. We still continue with the wrong practices and the destructive practices. In your mind, if we are talking about two-thirds of primary production, but forest as a whole gives a lot of other benefits. 
So total benefits which we derive from the forest, two third of that total benefits come from the invisible services, which we are not accounting. So only one third we are accounting, and out of one third, two third is uh, of the land's primary production comes. So if you take into consideration the invisibility factor, also in the recognition of this value, then the entire concept of total economic value which we are recognizing changes. So it is very, very important that first we need to recognize which involves identification and assessment of complete stakeholders, both in terms of the benefit which they derive as well as the way they impact the ecosystem. Both ways it needs to be evaluated. The next important issue is demonstrating value. So when we have recognized that value, it needs to be demonstrated in economic terms. So when we are, unless and until you demonstrate in the economic terms, you will not be able to influence the decision makers. So for influencing decision makers, demonstrating value in economic terms is very, very important. So it is useful for policy makers to consider the full cost and benefits of the proposed use of ecosystem before reaching any kind of decision. And it should consider cost over and above what enters into the market. So not only the provisioning services, so in the decision making process, you should identify both, uh, the, you should uh, demonstrate cost of both tangible and the intangible benefits. So it needs an estimation. So now we have already recognized that all these stakeholders the kind of benefits which they are driving and the kind of impact they are giving or doing, making in the, in the ecosystem. After we have evaluated, identified and assessed, now we need to do an estimation. That is, it needs to be analyzed with the linkage over scale and time. That means what is the range of impact, whether it is positive or negative, some people may be impacting positively the environment and some people negatively as well as over time. That means the impact has to be estimated over a period of time. One stakeholder would be impacting negatively and getting a benefit. The, over a period of time, his impact is nil and his benefit is also nil. But the other stakeholder who has been impacting positively the ecosystem his impact over a long period of time, over a later stage of the time, is, you know, the, the benefits which it derives becomes absolutely zero. So there is a there is a disproportionate assessment of all the stakeholders who are influencing and impacting the ecosystem. So it needs to be done about the ranging and scaling of each ecosystem, each uh, stakeholders of the ecosystem, and it should be done over a period of time when this benefit is going to be realized, if today, if I start to do, say, for example, I, I plant trees and I plant millions of trees, the nation decides that entire river basin needs to be planted with trees. So I am impacting the society, but it's, and, and the benefit, uh, the benefits of this environmental impact will not be, you know, used by me. It would be used maybe 20, 30, 40 years down by another generation and another section of the society. So it needs to be evaluated over a period of time as well as with the range and scale. So it needs to be done both at the global as well as the local level. You know, the current as well as the future, what is the urban and the rural aspect of that. So all these needs to be you know, uh, decided only then we will be able to come to the total economic value. Then we can see that, yes, once we demonstrate, we see that the total cost of preserving the environment outweighs definitely the short term benefits which we derive from the environment with only focusing on the uh, provisioning services or the primary production activities. So, after you have demonstrated the entire aspect, you have recognized. You have demonstrated over the range and scale for all these stakeholders, the next step would be to capture that. So when I say capture, 
people may argue that yes, you have already recognized, you have already demonstrated, it has already been estimated over a period of time, then it is that means it has already been captured. But capturing here means that you need to put a mechanism by which you put some kind of incentive towards preserving the you know, biodiversity or the ecosystem which you are talking. So it is introducing a mechanism to acknowledge or incorporate in the ecosystem and biodiversity decision-making process. The moment I have demonstrated and I do not capture it in, the, in, in my decision-making process, I say that you know, I want to preserve a national park and I say it is free for all. There is no entry fee. Then, even if you have recognized, estimated, you have not captured in your decision making process because the moment you assign a zero value, nobody is going to you know, do anything about it. So, capturing the value in the decision making process is the process by which you put incentive to influence human behavior and try and link it to the market for. Tangible, certainly it is very, very easy, but for intangibles, it becomes very, very difficult. Say, for example, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, Uttarakhand, Uttarakhand suddenly decided to have an auto cluster. Of all the places in Uttarakhand, Patragar is having an auto cluster. But there are so many other industries which have come there. So it's becoming a big uh, industrial hub. So the government has incentivized certain decisions by its decisions that I'll give you tax breaks. I'll give you, you know, uh, free electricity, land registration cost will be uh, easy, provided you are able to preserve the environment and then you are able to enjoy the benefits. So if you are only doing taking tax breaks and not doing the activity related to preserving of the environment, there will be a penalty also associated with it. So unless and until you put incentivize or put a penalty for misuse of the incentives which is given, you will not be able to change the industry. And that becomes, you know, the first process of capturing value in our decision making process. Many people have been doing it. You know, they, you know, they brand their product as, you know, organic product or eco-friendly product. So that is also one way of, you know, you set up you have captured a value. The government has captured a value in the in the entire uh, process of decision making, given you the benefits. You are also preserving, and at the same time, you are using those benefits to promote you know, the goods and services which you are producing uh, without impact negatively impacting the ecosystem. So that is what I mean when we talk about capturing value in the biodiversity. So it is important to assess and incorporate that value in the decision-making process. Failure to do so will have a negative impact on human conscience and behavior and in our treatment and relationship with nature. And we have already mentioned that it includes subsidies, fiscal incentives, tax rates, equal labeling, certification. So now when we have already done this entire process of recognizing, demonstrating, capturing, what would be the next step? The next step is to understand how this entire model, the flow of model happens in the ecosystem services. So internationally, you see United Nations Environmental Program has you know, evaluated or developed certain kind of framework. And they call it a system for Environmental Economic Accounting, S-E-E-A. And it has got two different frameworks. One is the central framework, which talks about the broad areas of economic activity and how do we account for those, including specific focus on individual assets. And then there is an experimental framework of S-E-E-A, which has been promulgated by UNEP. So S-E-E-A talks about an experimental framework which we based on which we decide how do we account for a biodiversity existing in a localized area so a lot of you, you say uh, india as a nation wants to conduct uh, an ecosystem accounting for certain river basin 
So they will first adopt an experimental framework, do an accounting system for that particular region. Based on the framework, you would like to extrapolate the similar in other river basins. Subsequently, based on the other river basin, you adopt a national level policy based on the central framework. So that is how the accounting system uh, takes place. And this accounting system, it considers the environment and the economy as two separate systems. When I'm talking about environment, that means it is talking about a biophysical environment, which has the assets, which people utilize the assets to produce certain kinds of ecosystem services. So this framework is accounted as one system. Subsequently, it is translated into goods and services which the society or the organization use. So that is the economic activity out of this is accounted as another system. So when we are talking about this measurement of ecosystem assets and the flow of services which happens through this assets, no, it happens both ways. Within the assets also, there is a, a you know a flow which is Newton cycle energy flow is which is maintained as well as there is flow for the various kinds of services also. So there is an ecosystem services and there is an assets flow which is happening. So when we are talking about an ecosystem assets, it has got we should understand what we what are the characteristics of the ecosystem. So when we talk about characteristics, it has got two components. One is ecology, the second is the location. And the ecology of the assets, the ecosystem characteristics talks about structure. So when he's talking about structure of the ecosystem, that means the kind of food web which is available within the ecosystem. Then it talks about the composition. What is the composition of this ecosystem? That means it includes various kinds of living organisms, flora, fauna, you know, as well as non-living mechanisms, organisms, which is minerals, water. So it has a composition of both living and non-living. It has a structure which decides what kind of food we have got. It has a process. Internally, inherently, it also has, as it also has its own process so that it maintains its nutrient cycle, whether you talk about photosynthesis, the decomposition, photosynthesis, decomposition, everything, these are all internal process which happens within the individual assets of the ecosystem. And then is the function. That means I'm talking about the nutrient cycle and the energy flow which happens within the assets. And the primary productivity, primary productivity activity which happens because of these assets. The next important activity or the characteristics is the location. When we are talking, we have understood what the ecology means, then is the location. Location talks about the extent. What is the entire area which we are talking about? This ecosystem, which is what is the area of that ecosystem? What is the configuration? That means how this ecosystem is organized. Do we have only one type of ecosystem in this area what we are talking, the extent where we are talking, or it has got multiple ecosystem and different biodiversity. That means it has got a river basin, it has got uh, you know uh, a forest, it has got wetlands, it has got grasslands. So the configuration which is existing within the extent of the ecosystem which we are talking about. Landscape forms. That means where this ecosystem is located, what is the landscape form? Is it a mountain region? It is a glacial region or is it a, a region which has got very high rainfall? Is it a, a marine aquatic region? So that, that location, the landscape form of the ecosystem is also important in determining the variability, the biodiversity, that means in terms of the quantity and the, uh, the quality of the species, which interact to form the uh, economic activity, which helps in the economic activity. And the last is the climate and seasonal patterns. The ecosystems are very largely affected by the climate regulations and uh, you know, seasonal factors. So it is very, very important to what extent, what kind of climatic condition it is existing in that area. 
And then based on all these assets, you have this biodiversity, which is existing within the ecosystem. And then there are abiotic resources, which means the non-living mechanism, organisms which are there, whether it is minerals or the energy resources, which is there in this entire ecosystem. So we have a bio physical environment, which has the assets, the assets, there is a biodiversity existing, and there is an abiotic resources, which is there. Within this, you derive an ecosystem services. What are the services which we talk that are the provisioning services, the regulating services and cultural services, because as I said, habitat services underpins all these services. So basically, in the normal parlance, we do not do an accounting for the habitat services. We only do an accounting for these three services. From the abiotic resources, also we have got various kinds of abiotic services, which we derive in terms of the minerals, energy resources. There is a space for the human habitat. We create infrastructure there. And then it leads us to various kinds of economic activity which whether it is you know tourism mineral energy products uh, food so these are all the activities which are tangible in nature and then you have got a intangible activity in terms of getting clean air protection from flood and forest uh, protection from flood soil erosion reduction in greenhouse gas emissions so this is the entire economic activity which accounts for the two third of the uh, 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 which accounts for the total economic activity. And these non accounted activity, what we are talking of, is the one which is a major chunk. So, when we have understood the broad flow based on which the experimental accounting is done, so there has to be a way in which we are accounting this. So, let us see in what ways do they consider it. So these are the units of ecosystem accounting. The way we account uh, any economic activity and give a numerical value. So there are, they have decided to have some kind of accounting in terms of uh, the units which they can associate with in the ecosystem. So basically there are three different types of units. One is called the basic spatial unit. The second is called the land cover and ecosystem functional unit. And third is the ecosystem accounting unit. So when I'm talking about an ecosystem accounting unit, you, you can do, develop this entire framework right from the bottom. That means you start with the BSU, create a LCU, LCEU, and then come to uh, an ecosystem accounting unit. Or you first decide an ecosystem accounting unit and then you know come to the LCEU or then come to the BSU. So it can be a top-down approach or a bottom-down approach. So if you see this framework, if you're talking about a basic spatial unit, so when we talk about a basic spatial unit, I say that yes, I'm looking at one square kilometer of forest area. So that becomes my basic spatial unit. And then we decide what is the land cover and ecosystem unit. So in this land cover ecosystem unit, what are the basic units, basic special units existing? Is it only forest or is it only marine or is it, you know, uh, what different types of each basic accounting special units we consider? And then we form a land cover accounting, uh, land cover ecosystem unit. Now this land cover ecosystem also, if you are considering the, uh, the extent of the ecosystem accounting unit, if you have got a broader framework, and uh, we consider that I would be you know, evaluating the complete uh, river basin of Godavari, which possibly Sadhguru uh, was, uh, the rally for river is, uh, was, was all about. So if you're talking about uh, an economic ecosystem accounting unit, it has got forest, it has got river, it has got certain other aspects of, you know, agricultural activity, vegetation, grasslands, everything comes within this entire uh, ecosystem accounting unit. 
and within the ecosystem accounting unit, you have got land cover ecosystem unit. That means a river basin is one type of land cover accounting unit. A forest would be another type of ecosystem accounting unit. You have got a marine, which is another type of ecosystem. So what are the different types of land cover accounting ecosystem unit existing within an ecosystem accounting unit? And then we formulate the entire process of doing an accounting. And this entire system of accounting has got a, some kind of classification, which is followed by, which is called the common international classification of ecosystem services. So this, the entire ecosystem accounting unit is done with this kind of framework. Only then we will be able to create a kind of uh, an economic plan for the decision makers to capture that kind of value in the uh, in the decision making process. Now let us see what are with this kind of framework. What are the benefits which we have actually derived? And we talk about uh, the benefits which people have derived following this ecosystem accounting unit. So tropical rainforest. A large value of regulatory services comes from the rainforests in terms of erosion prevention, pollution control, water purification. And uh, they did uh, uh, a very specific study in Costa Rica and estimated that uh, and estimated that uh, almost the that pollination, the patches of uh, pollination services, which is provided by these patches of forest for their coffee plantation, accounted for almost 375 US dollars per hectare per year, which is almost 7% of the farm fee. So this accounting was not there earlier, but now when they actually did a study, they put, put a specific value to this, which is 300 and 395 US dollars per hectare. The same way, Cameroon also did a provisioning services study. And for the timber, and they found that the Cameroon forest gives accounts for almost 560 US dollar for the timber and uh, 61 US dollar for fuel wood, uh, for fuel wood, and roughly 41 to 70 dollars for non-timber forest products per hectare per year. So this is the kind of specific provisioning services which they have got, uh, they, they could associate with. But uh, if you see the, uh, you know, the poll uh, pollination services, that 7% which was, which was invisible in our accounting system suddenly came into the into accounting system. Hawaii coral reef, again a study was conducted and they found that there was a net benefit of more than 360 million US dollars only from the ecosystem which we are uh, from the various services which we are getting from the ecosystem. Same way for Laos, uh, wetland conservation study was done and uh, they found that uh, if you preserve the wetland, conserve the fed land, it helps in flood protection and approximately it accounts for 5 million US dollars. So global fisheries, we are talking about global fisheries, global fisheries, uh, fisheries performed by around 500 US dollars, 50 billion US dollars annually. If 50 billion dollars is annually accounted for global fisheries, only from the wetland protection of hail harbor in Bangladesh, they could improve their fish catch of fish production by almost 80%. So 
so you can imagine the uh, you know the kind of benefits which people have started to derive by following the system they do it at a particular area and ecosystem accounting is done for a particular area the value is captured then they you know include it in the decision making process and incentivize these kind of things the next i think it is uh, say for example beekeeping beekeeping generates 213 million dollars annually in switzerland a single bee colony generates us dollar 1050 in pollination of fruits and berries per year in 2002 and it was compared to if you compare this 1050 us dollars per year in 2002 so and you compare with the direct product it only is 215 dollars which is which we get in terms of you know honey or wax so the pollination which happens because of beekeeping the its effect is almost five times more and we have not been accounting for this another example is conserving forest avoids greenhouse gas emission this is this is a very big uh, amount which we are talking about which is close to 3.7 trillion dollars if you half halving the deforest rate by 2030 would reduce global greenhouse gas emission by 1.5 to 2.7 gt carbon dioxide per year thereby avoiding damage from climate change which is estimated at more than 3.7 trillion dollars in net present value now uh, when i'm talking about reduction these these the co benefits which we are deriving from the forest the primary benefits which are we are not taking into account these are the invisible uh, benefits which we are deriving only by preserving the forest or reducing the def deforestation rate and as i mentioned that more than two third of the total economic value which we are considering for our economic evaluation comes from these invisible or intangible services regulating services which we get from the forest green products and services another example it represents a new market global sales of organic food and drink have recently been increasing by over 5 billion dollars every year reaching to almost 46 billion dollars in 2007 so if there are there are awareness which is coming into our society there is awareness which is coming within the business organization at the national level at the global level there is lot of initiative which has been taken by the uh, united nations environmental program they have commissioned uh, uh, something called uh, teeb the economy of environmental uh, and biodiversity there is a committee which forms this kind of report which has developed this kind of framework which conducts various kinds of studies globally and uh, they are able to give a value by the method of accounting process the framework which they have developed so that it can influence the decision making process which gets recorded or captured as a policy for uh, the people to change their behavior and their attitude towards environment now with these uh, words i end my talk if there are any questions i would be very very happy to take now there is a question there are two three questions which has come 
how do dependencies on natural capital put the business at risk in fact i think it is contrary no we do, we in, we have seen that almost two third of our primary production comes from this natural capital only the problem comes when we try and influence the quantity and the quality of the species or the microorganisms or the the biodiversity which is existing in the natural in the uh, in the ecosystem to suit our requirement because you always think in short terms if you do not disturb it and try use the natural capital with the process of replenishing it and leave the pro the you know the uh, the ecosystem to maintain its own nutrient cycle and energy flow i don't think so there will be a problem but we are our own try and make influence that kind of thing we disturb that ecosystem to an extent that we do not get the desired benefit so it uh, it doesn't really put business at risk in fact it it is a risk mitigation process because any business uh, you know it has a concept of continuity you do not start a business to close it one or two years down the line you always look for a business to continue for another 100 years so the next generation can also you know take the decisions forward and if you are looking at those long term protection of the environment doesn't impact in fact it is a facilitator and an enhance an answer in the business decision process now there is another question how can we incorporate natural capital and ecosystem services into policy and management i think uh, you know to a large extent uh, i have already addressed that in my uh, discussion and talk that they have uh, there is a framework which has been promulgated by unap and they have got a policy guidelines based on which you are able to decide and incorporate that kind of or assign some kind of value now specific assignment of a value you know it requires a more detailed discussion going into uh, you know when you are talking about provisioning services you have got forest what all kinds of activity which you can get from the forest now primary produce which you get from the forest that forest is located in which particular region to what extent it is affected by the uh, environmental conditions and the local situations the cultural issues then only you would be able to extract certain amount of primary produce so it needs to be categorized on various types of ecosystem and various types of services unless or until you make that kind of format table which classifies the services and the kind of uh, you know benefits which you are deriving under the different services from the environmental assets whether it is forest or marine or river basin or wetlands or grasslands then you will be able to make the complete matrix that matrix can then be converted into the kind of an economic activity which gets recorded in the ecosystem accounting is there a way for companies to measure their level of sustainability on the basis of natural capital there is another question yes certainly if you are uh, getting into a mining activity if your company is into mining and you do not replenish if you continue your mining there will be a time where all these uh, uh, mineral resources will go so if you do not continue with the mining and do not think of uh, you know again planting trees a forestation if you do not think of and only think of deforestation obviously your business activity cannot continue for a very very long time so i think your long term sustainability if you evaluate for in fact for any any activity whether you are talking about uh, you know uh, fishing or steel production 
or you know any, any kind of activity business activity the primary source comes from the forest and if you are not going to think about replenishment of this your long-term sustainability cannot be guaranteed so i think uh, there were one or two more questions are existing green economy solutions being overlooked in covid 19 response no i think certainly not this is another question i feel we are becoming more aware about it. the covid challenge has given us an opportunity to recognize that yes people are actually falling back on the on the environment for their sustainability which earlier they had not recognized so it actually making a thing a change in our thinking process to recognize environment as one of the sources of income in the times of crisis and most of the companies have also started to realize that so if i say if i talk about i'm from jamshedpur and if i talk about tata steel so if you see almost uh, uh, a decade back tata steel had a campaign which says we also make steel they never talked about the steel making process or the quality of the goods or services their campaign was we also make steel now few years back their campaign is we also make tomorrow so it is now changing the thought process of the organization itself and this thought process is now getting reinforced during the covid response so i certainly feel that uh, you know it is going to uh, change our behavior the way we look at the environment and the uh, covid 19 pandemic is an opportunity for us to have a relook in our uh, attitude towards environment. Thank you. Oh, great. Here we will conclude today's webinar. It was an excellent and very informative presentation. Thank you so much, Commander Sanjeev Raman, for your expertise. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we look forward to your participation in all our upcoming activities.